This is actually one of the most studied types of clay and honestly the list of benefits is kind of endless. a pediatric occupational therapist and mum. Don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel for more about play and child development in these magical little years. Before we get started, I want to hear from you. Did you play rough and tumble as a kid? Let me know down in the comment box below. And also just as a disclaimer, we're going to be talking today about using rough play with little kids. So obviously we need to use a lot of common sense here. Always follow your child, always be alert and maintain safety while playing. Rough and tumble play, what is it? Just a heads up, this video is part of a series all about different types of play for young children. So if you're wanting to extend your toddler's play past building another block tower, be sure to check that out. So rough and tumble play is physical play, sometimes involving elements of power play or play fighting, but more centrally involving two people, your child and yourself, and your bodies as the play instruments. What it is not is hurting our children and then dismissing it in the name of play. Does that mean that there'll never be a knocked knee or a bumped head? No, likely there will be, but what's really important here is that we don't aim for that and that we always stop when needed. And that brings us to some of the reasons why parents often fear rough and tumble play. The first one is that we worry that playing like this will decrease our child's body boundaries and therefore make them more vulnerable to abuse. Now, obviously, this is every parent's worst nightmare. I just want to point out here that today we're talking about rough and tumble play for one to four year old children between a parent and a child. Rough housing with other adults or other children is kind of a separate topic. And what I'm really wanting you to take out of this video is ways that you can use rough housing to increase body awareness teach good boundaries, and also teach your children how to verbalize and say, stop. All of these are super important qualities in protecting our kids against abuse. The other reason that we shy away from this type of play is because we think that it encourages aggression. There have been a number of studies around this. Some rat studies showed that horseplay actually decreases aggression as well as symptoms of ADHD. And we'll dive into this in a minute, but to answer this question of does rough housing cause aggression in children, I want to point towards one really fascinating research paper. So this was a human study done in 2009 that actually observed 85 fathers and their children, aged 2 to 6, playing. And then they followed up five years later to measure the children's behavior. When the father and son had a good relationship during the play, and the parent was the dominant one and able to push the brakes at the right time, you know, before like someone gets slapped or someone's getting hurt, those kids were seen to be more pro-social and have better emotional control in their school years. However, the families whereby the father let the child completely dominate the play, the kids were shown five years later to be more aggressive and have less emotional control than their peers. Letting our children completely dominate this type of play can send them the message that aggression is an effective way to control others. So this tells us that boundaries and a parent that can analyze and put the brakes on at the right time is critical for rough and tumble play in order to reap all of its benefits. Furthermore, roughhousing doesn't necessarily have to include fighting. While power play or letting your kiddo feel like the winner or the boss or the man in charge is an amazing thing for toddlers, let's face it, they're kind of disempowered people. It may not always feel like it, but toddlers hear the word no a lot. So creating a play environment that gives them a measure or a sense of power is a really good thing to alleviate those effects and also build their self-confidence. But honestly, we use this kind of dynamic in many different types of play. Think about when you play doctor patient with your toddler or if you're playing teacher student. So 
If you're not comfortable with fighting, no problem. Roughhousing doesn't necessarily have to go hand in hand with power play or fighting. In fact, in the next video, I'm going to be breaking down five rough and tumble games that don't involve fighting at all. Okay, so the way that we play is really important, but what are the reasons to get started with roughhousing in the first place? This is actually one of the most studied types of play, and honestly, the list of benefits is kind of endless. The most popular being resilience and emotional control. And if you want to find more about that or why that is, I've linked a video on risky play above, um, which dives more into the rationale behind this. The three points that I want to focus on today are firstly social skills. There are a bunch of human and animal studies showing the tremendous effect of this type of play on social skills. Kids that rough and tumble the right way have an easier time making friends, understanding and reading people, and also controlling their emotions during play. Why is this? Firstly, the element of when to stop is kind of central to horseplay, and this gives our children an amazing opportunity to start reading people. Was that sore? Can I do it again? Are we still playing or are we fighting now? This ability to recognize that we're playing versus when we're fighting is critical in social development. Social skills that are practiced in roughhousing with a parent give them the ability to then go out into the world and read social cues as well as respect others' limits. Studies have even shown that when rats play fight, it dramatically activates the release of chemical growth factors in different parts of the brain that are linked to processing of social information. Rough and tumble play is also a way to give our nervous system an opportunity to reset. We often think of ourselves as kind of just the heads. We forget that we're also bodies and we're actually whole holistic individuals and so are our children. When we break down exactly how we process and take in the world around us, it's sensory. Our kids are growing, learning, literally wiring their brains, and they are taking in a lot. A three-year-old's brain is twice as active as an adult's brain. All of this taking it in can easily overwhelm our children and they can become overloaded or dysregulated. Roughhousing, you know, that being lifted, flipped over, bumping, crashing, falling, all provide a really good dose of vestibular and proprioceptive inputs. These are like the calming levers that our bodies have to reset our nervous system and give us a chance to unload all of that pent-up sensory input and, in a sense, to exhale. It also gives our children an opportunity to unload their emotional backpack. Have you ever stubbed your toe and then ended up crying for 20 minutes about something that happened a week ago? Yeah, that often happens as well during rough and tumble. And it's actually a really, really good thing. This uh, providing opportunity for an emotional release is one of the stepping stones for preventing anxiety in our children. And that's kind of important because we know at the moment, one third of all American teens suffer from anxiety. So creating the space that they can unload of that emotional backpack is a gift for our kids. The other amazing benefit of romping around is body awareness. One of the first skills that children need to develop for mobility is their sense of where their body is in relation to the space around them. So from those early days of sucking on their toes to figure out where they need to put each foot as they're climbing up a tree or knowing how hard to thump down during a good session of roughhousing, this body awareness is a basic skill that develops in the early years but influences everything from writing to standing too close to other people to driving. In roughhousing, children really get to learn the boundaries of their own body and practice coordinating movement as well as tempering the amount of force that they use. All of this with the factor of human touch is incredibly valuable in learning body awareness. For me as an occupational therapist, this is roughhousing's main drawing card. In my 10 years experience working with kids, 
Predominantly, when a child presents with motor or learning difficulties, I found that body awareness or these basic skills of sensory processing are where we need to go back to and replay these kind of games to develop these critical underlying skills. So how do we play rough and tumble with toddlers in order to get all of those benefits? The first thing is that we need to be the ones that are in control as the adults. We need to be analyzing when to stop. Let's remember that everything required in this type of play is still being developed at this age, especially impulse control. Let's hold space for that and also know when to de-escalate things. We need to set clear boundaries. Let's not take it for granted that young kids understand that kicking you in the face is out of bounds. Tell them no touching of faces, no scratching, no pulling hair, no biting, or any other boundaries that you want to set. I also personally really like having a physical boundary too, like playing on a mat or a carpet. So there's a physical space in which this play can take place. Have a safe word as well. It might be stop or red light or banana. It doesn't really matter what the word is, but it's important to give our children a tool that they can tell us to stop and then always honor when they've said that. It's also really important to have a clear start and end. For our family, we have a very clear, this is our home's play time, and this is only done with one of us parents. In other words, I personally don't let my two and four year old play like this when they're alone, maybe in the future, but for now, while we're still very much learning impulse control and body boundaries, it's only done with one of us parents. Yes, that could be two children running after mommy monster, but it's not just the two of them alone playing like this. It's also great to start thinking about doing this type of play before bedtime, like a while before bedtime, maybe an hour before bedtime, because it will rile your kids up. And um, so you want to give them adequate time to calm back down before they go to sleep. So are you ready to get started? As I said before, this video is part of a series of different types of play that support early childhood development. In the next video, I'm diving into 10 different types of rough and tumble games that we love. Some involve safe play fighting and some have no fighting at all. Each is powerful in supporting the development of one to four year olds. You can click on the video that's on your screen now and I'll see you over there. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel so you can get next week's video. All of the referenced research is in the description box below.